theoretical physicist. Uh, nevertheless, I've been given the honor to introduce these uh, wonderful chemists and life scientists. Um, I guess my relation to the Nano Center is that I study uh, the theory of nanomechanical systems, uh, but uh, nothing about that. Our first speaker is Chad Merkin. Uh, he is one of the three laureates of the Dan uh, David Prize this year. Um, I won't say anything about him except the fact that this is already his second prize that he's receiving here at Tel Aviv University. In 2003, if I'm not mistaken, he uh, received the Sackler Prize here, uh, which we believe is a great predictor for uh, even better and bigger prizes in the future. And this is a proof of that, and we think that this is not the end of the line. So uh, we hope that uh, this is just the beginning of even more prizes. So without further ado, I think you've heard a lot about the laureates. Uh, please, Chad, the uh, podium is yours. Fantastic. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, it's, it's really a, a great honor to, to be here. Uh, again, I want to thank uh, the Dan David Foundation, the family, uh, and Tel Aviv University for this incredible honor. Uh, I was here 13 years ago uh, for the Sackler Prize, uh, and it was a fantastic visit, and I made a lot of friends that remain my friends today. See them all over the world, including Israel, and it's always exciting to come back and see all the incredible progress that's going on here. Um, Yossi Klafter, I guess he wasn't president back then; he was maybe chairman of the department. Uh, it was kind of—he's a very prophetic man because um, uh, at the time um, when I came for the Sackler Prize, um, he was all caught up in, I guess, the excitement of the Dan David Prize. And around me, he was talking about this incredible million-dollar prize that was going to be given out and draw an incredible spotlight on, on science. And then he kind of looked at me, and he thought, oh, God, this isn't very good. I'm kind of comparing the two. And he said, oh, but maybe you can come back in a few years. <laughs> so I, I like the way he thinks. Um, in, any way, in any event, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the things we're doing with uh, what I like to refer to as spherical nucleic acids. And this concept of, of programmable assembly, and, and Paul's talk really uh, set the stage for much of what I'm going to talk about. I mean, he talked about moving atoms around and trying to figure out how to make perfect nanocrystals. We're thinking about building materials in, in a very different way. We also think about nanoscience very differently. Yossi said, well, this is really just chemistry. I think it's actually more than chemistry. Uh, it, it's, it's a way of thinking about science in a, in a, in a different way, uh, a recognition of the fact that structures on this length scale are bigger than the conventional molecular systems that most chemists work with, uh, yet smaller than, than the bulk materials that we often rely on for many of the technological applications that we use. Um, and it's an understanding that when you work on this length scale and when you can arrange matter on this length scale that you can begin to realize properties uh, that lead to new technologies that I think is really quite important. And that's really kind of the story of my whole career and, and my entry into this particular area and some of the things that we've discovered over the last couple of decades. So in the spirit of the past, present, and future, let's take a step back to the past. Um, I was talking to some of the students yesterday, I think John brought this up, that this, this was really an important discovery. I think there's nobody in this room that would argue that. When Watson and Crick, along with Rosalind Franklin, figured out uh, the structure of DNA and reported to the world really changed the way we thought about many different things. For the first time, we understood the structure of the blueprint of life. But if you think about it, that understanding led to so many other advances right, in terms of how cells function, for example. So many new technologies, forensic applications, medical diagnostic tools, a whole new wave of therapeutics are coming online because of an understanding of this particular structure. Without it, we wouldn't be able to do it. And so this was, you know, really a critical advance. And it's something that also led to a lot of the ways that we think about many of the scientific problems that we address at Northwestern. Now, again, if we go back, and this is the Sackler days, the Sackler Prize days, um, we uh, got famous early on for thinking about uh, building a, a new form of nucleic acid. Uh, our idea back in the mid-90s was that you could begin to think about DNA not as a biological construct, but as a chemical or materials construct. And you could think about developing chemistry that would allow you to take short strands of DNA and interface it with many of the beautiful particle type structures that Paul showed. Why would you want to do that? 
Well, the idea was very simple. We could begin to think of particles as atoms, and we could think of oligonucleotides as programmable bonds. And we could then begin to develop a new type of chemistry where you could build materials from the bottom up and force the assembly of beautiful, highly crystalline architectures where you could control all the different parameters of those structures through the choice of particle building blocks and oligonucleotide building blocks. And so that kind of set us on uh, uh, an odyssey uh, to begin to look at the, the properties of these structures, to look at how we could make different types of structures. And we discovered a lot of things along the way. And one of the things we discovered was, first of all, when we make these architectures, it's not one strand of DNA per particle, it's many strands. And that's why I use the term spherical nucleic acid. Under the right conditions, you can create structures that in cartoon fashion look like this on the left. You can see the electron microscopy images on the upper right, where you have a particle core, in this case a gold particle, surrounded by a shell of DNA or RNA or any specialty nucleic acid that you'd like. And that's a highly programmable construct. And we began to kind of develop that from a material standpoint. We also began to look at how these types of structures interacted with biological systems. And what we discovered was not only was this an incredible materials construct in terms of building new materials, but it constituted a completely new form of what I would like to think of as the most important molecule ever discovered by scientists, ever synthesized by chemists. There is no natural version of a spherical nucleic acid. This is only made through concepts from chemistry and nanoscience. Yet these types of structures on a sequence for sequence basis do things completely differently from their linear cousins. Why do I say that? Um, well, look at this slide here. This is uh, a, a uh, table that uh, I took from a review article, a perspective article that I wrote about three years ago where we coined the term spherical nucleic acid. It's kind of neat. At that time in 2012, it was one of the few terms you could go to Google type in spherical nucleic acid and get zero hits. That's hard to do. <laughs> and that tells you that people really didn't think about this. What? Uh, uh, about uh, uh, a couple million right now. Because oh, it, it, this kind of changed the way you thought about this, this architecture. And, and I'll, show, I'll show you why it's so important in a second. Um, so, so again, because there's no natural version of this type of architecture and there wasn't a recognition of the fact that these, this arrangement of nucleic acids was important, but it is. Uh, you look at it in almost every category. Uh, if we look at the ability to bind, right, a complementary nucleic acid, remember DNA, there are two strands that come together to form the double helix. If I take a spherical nucleic acid and bind it to a complementary nucleic acid, it binds about 100 times more tightly than a linear nucleic acid. Why is it? That's not just phenomenological. It turns out when you tack oligonucleotides down into this spherical architecture on a surface and pre-orient them, you wipe out a lot of the entropic penalty associated with hybridization or forming the duplex. And for that, for that reason, spherical nucleic acids on a sequence or sequence basis will always bind complementary nucleic acids more tightly. That's a powerful concept. What that means is you can begin to create probes, for example, that soak up lower concentrations of target in the same sequence with, for example, a molecular fluorophore probe with a single-stranded type of architecture. If I look at the subsequent melting properties, normal DNA melts over a very broad temperature range. These types of structures melt over a very narrow temperature range. You can get them down to a single degree. Why is that important? Well, I can use that to create high selectivity probes so that I get not only high sensitivity, but also high selectivity or the ability to discriminate between different types of targets. This guy must have a core, and it doesn't have to be gold. As I'm going to show you, it can be almost any material you'd like. And that allows you to tailor all the physical and chemical properties, the plasmonic, the catalytic, the magnetic, the luminescent properties of such structures. But this is what really made me a believer that we were on to something pretty spectacular, at least from a, a structure function standpoint, from a biology standpoint. Um, most people are taught, if they take general chemistry or biochemistry or biology, that nucleic acids will not naturally enter cells. I'm talking about human cells, for example, mammalian cells. Uh, why is that? Well, the cell wall is negatively charged, and DNA is negatively charged. So it kind of makes sense. And it also makes sense from, a, from a, a, a life standpoint. You don't want a lot of foreign nucleic acids moving in and out of your, your cells. That could cause a lot of problems. And it turns out that that's, in fact, true. You can do the experiment. I'll show you in a second. But spherical nucleic acids not only go in, they actively go in. And in fact, they go in to very large extents. And you can see that right here. 
So if I look at epithelial cells in this case, shown up in the upper panel, I take a linear nucleic acid with a fluorophore, a signaling agent, it gives off a red signal in this case, you can see there's no appreciable uptake. You take that exact same sequence and you arrange it into a spherical nucleic acid form. As I said, not only does it go in, it goes in better than anything known to man. And we know why that is. We've studied that now over the last decade. Uh, it turns out there are things called scavenger receptors on the surfaces of many cells. So this is actually common to many cell types that can recognize the three-dimensional architecture that defines a spherical nucleic acid, localize it on the cell wall, and take the structure in via a process called caviolin mediated endocytosis. Linear nucleic acids are not recognized. So that's kind of neat. We're in hijacking nature's a natural machinery in this case to effectively get cells to take in large amounts of, of a nucleic acid type of architecture. Why is that important? Well, that enables applications. And, and so this kind of actually took us down a side path away from that concept of materials design to the development of new types of biological applications. There are detection systems that take advantage of the probe characteristics that I referred to. In fact, a company called Nanosphere that was just sold to Luminex has 10 FDA cleared assays and they're growing big panel assays that allow you to basically look at different genetic signatures associated with disease. Big application is looking at sepsis. You want rapid, uh, uh, high accuracy detection at the point of use and you'd like to be able to discriminate between the different bugs that a particular patient's infected with. Why? The doctor needs information rapidly and needs to know what they're infected with to figure out what antibiotic to prescribe. These are really neat structures. There are you know, 1,800 different commercial products now. 1,600 come from this particular class of spherical nucleic acid. These are things we call nano flares. These are structures that <coughs> are very similar to what I described, except they have a short oligonucleotide, a short strand of DNA with a fluorophore hybridized to the particle surface. And that's designed that way because the gold is a great quencher. It turns off fluorescence. So this is spectroscopically silent. These structures can be fed to cells, as I just showed you. They'll go into cells. And if there's a particular RNA present that is recognized by a strand that we've you know, designed it to recognize, it binds and releases the flare and turns on fluorescence. Why is that important? That turns out to be the only known way to measure the genetic content of live cells. So now you can put this on a flow cytometer. For example, I can feed a, a, a blood sample with different nano flares and I can look for different cancer markers. And I can look for the needle in the haystack. I can sort the different rare cells and the circulating tumor cells, for example, based upon the fact that they overexpress a particular gene. And so this is a, a, not only an incredible uh, 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 type of structure in terms of understanding new science and studying living systems, but it leads to new ways of diagnosing disease. It leads to new ways of treating disease because the cells can be collected then in live form. And so one of the things you'd like to know is if I have a patient population, why do 70% of the patients respond to a particular drug cocktail and 30% don't? Well, I can take those cells in this particular case and begin to, again, use personalized medicine to begin to study why that is in fact the case because I collect those particular cells in live form. And there are lots of other things you can do with this as well. And then this is the really exciting one from a, from a medical standpoint. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this today. Uh, it's another talk. Uh, but these structures, this ability to move large amounts of nucleic acids into cells are being taken advantage of in terms of developing new therapeutic agents. Therapeutic agents that can be used to regulate gene expression. You can take these and create topical creams that will go into skin so that you can begin to flip genetic switches that allow you to correct problems associated with psoriasis, melanoma, atopic dermatitis the colon, eyes, brain, lots of different types of applications because of this rapid cellular uptake. You can even use them to begin to create very powerful immunomodulatory agents that train a, a patient's immune system to fight disease in a very specific manner. The reason you can do that is the nucleic acids can be made very selective for triggering different toll-like receptors that either ratchet up or suppress the immune system in a very selective manner. As I said, big bets are being made. These, are these have gone into clinical trials now. They're actually in Europe and in, in Germany. And many, many drugs are going to be developed based upon this concept. And what I like about it is it comes from an understanding of, again, these structure function rela relationships and what makes nanomaterials, in this case, new arrangements of nucleic acids unique. OK, I like to show that because that gives me a license then to talk about things that have no technological value which I'm still very interested in. And that is really the original dream. Uh, 
the idea that we had back in 96, and, and Paul's group was thinking along this line as well, they were taking a, a different tact in the sense they were taking the particles with a single strand of DNA and trying to create, as he referred to, molecular systems. We wanted to build arrays, and we wanted to be able to develop this concept of uh, uh, thinking about a particle as an atom and an oligonucleotide as a programmable bond, and think about building matter from the bottom up. Uh, and we didn't want to be, or at least our view was, we wouldn't, with this type of approach, be constrained by what nature constrains us with. Of course, we can do a lot of things with conventional chemistry. Here's our table of elements, our building blocks, and depending upon how we arrange them, we get different materials with different properties and different functions. Now, to think about this, you have to think about scale. Um, so if we go from an atom to a nanoparticle, um, we're really increasing the size of these building blocks. And so from my standpoint, we had to think about molecules as linkers that would follow that analogy and would be uh, uh, comparably large. Uh, and that limits really the, the pool of, of candidates, comp comparably large and molecularly pure. Uh, in addition, you wanted to have interaction pairs that you could program that gave you a lot of flexibility. So to me, that really left peptides or oligonucleotides. And so we centered on oligonucleotides because the idea was that if you packed them into this very dense form, you could get directionality, and that rigidity would allow you then to program interactions and, and bonding interactions in such a way that you could realize functional materials. So this is the idea in cartoon fashion. We wanted to learn how to take any set of building blocks. Paul's shown some spectacular ones that, that have been made. Many groups around the world have now developed ways of making different types of particles, controlling size, shape, and composition. And then we'd like to be able to assemble them into these beautiful structures in cartoon fashion shown here, where we can control the crystal symmetry, the lattice parameters, the distance between the particles, the orientation if they're non-spherical particles, right? And then even the crystal habit. You know, think about it. As chemists, we can't do that. I'm going to show you actually can in this particular field. Okay, so, so if a, a chemist makes a new molecule, nobody can tell you what crystal it'll form until they actually do it. Because there are too many interactions to model. It's too, it's, it's, it's too difficult. Not in this particular case, as you're going to see. You can even control dimensionality. You can begin to build three-dimensional architectures like this or one-dimensional systems like this. That turns out to be very important in the field of plasmonics, as you'll hear, I think, uh, in, in John Pendry's talk as well. Okay, so now we go back again. This was where we were when I came for the Sackler Prize. It, it, you know, I was very proud of this back then, I, and we actually published this in Nature. I look at it now, I go, oh my God, how did we even get this thing in Nature? This is crazy. But we'd got it in there because it was conceptually really important and we'd actually proven the concept to a degree. The idea, as I said, was to take particles, functionalize them with DNA, use linker molecules, and assemble them into three-dimensional networks where we could control at least periodicity. And we did that. And we knew we did that because if we took these systems and we heated them, they would melt exactly at the melting temperature of the duplex uh, interconnects holding them together. And it was a highly reversible process and you could watch the raveling and unraveling of the DNA based upon the plasmonic properties of the particles. That actually led us down the path of developing new types of diagnostic tools. And then these were the not so impressive structures that we had generated. In fact, looking back at this, is these are actually not the connected structures in, under the electron beam. These are the, the particles that are left behind after the, 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 they, they dehybridize. But they give you at least a snapshot of, of, of what you had, which was kind of an amorphous aggregate of, of, of particles. Well, today, we make these types of structures. Uh, and we've learned how to do this because we spent a lot of time studying what's important in this particular area. Uh, and it really builds off some of the themes that Paul introduced, this idea of, of kinetic versus thermodynamic control. We were snuck, stuck in kinetic traps, as I'm going to show you, in, in, in the 90s. We would used long linkers, and, and so the system had not equilibrated and come to the final thermodynamic product. This is a BCC crystal structure. It's a rhombic dodecahedron. You will always get this particular structure, because this is what's called the Wolf construction. It is the thermodynamic sink. And so what we've been asking is how do we take this incredible number of building blocks that the, the whole field is developing, and how do we put them all together to create our new table of elements and begin to build materials from the bottom up where we can control all of the architectural parameters that I alluded to, and in the process, realize architectures that have new properties that will hopefully lead, like in the case of the native particles themselves, to new technologies, and I'm confident they will. And so that's why I think from a very fundamental standpoint, this is a, a field worth uh, very aggressively pursuing. So what's important here? Well, the particle's really important, and so as I said, lots of people, including our own group, are spending time trying to make more and more perfect particles. 
because that, those are your atomic building blocks. The, 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 the greater number of imperfections, the more difficult time you have in terms of getting crystallinity. And we'll, we'll look at that in, in, in detail in a little bit. But the bond's important. And, and you can see here we have an oligonucleotide, in this case a duplex connection, with a sticky end here. That's a single strand there. That's our recognition element. Those bases program what the particles recognize. And you can see this is really quite short compared to the rest of the structure. That was actually one of the important insights we made in the uh, 2000s. Uh, you need a system that is strong enough in terms of holding the particles together, but weak enough that you get fast on-off rates and can equilibrate and fall into these thermodynamic sinks. Um, you need a rigid structure, but you also need some flexibility built into these systems. And so you can see there are breakpoints here. We have an anchoring strand, which allows us to attach it to a particle. The chemistry is different depending upon the particle you're going to use. And then you have a linker strand. That allows you to control the bond length. Right, so, so we can dial in the, the length of the bond as, as well as the recognition properties that we'd like for a given system. And so if you think about this, you know, we can begin to force interaction pairs. So we can take two different particles, two different green colors in this case, and force them to assemble based upon the base pairing interactions that we all know are associated with DNA. And any really high school student can tell you the different sequences that are important in terms of recognizing others, right, ATGC. Um, so, um, if you think about this, and, and I want you to think about it because it's, it's really a new type of chemistry it, it, that is similar to some of the things that we do, but very different in other regards. Uh, this is interesting because we can independently control the bond from the atom, and you can't do that with conventional chemistry. We're stuck with what nature gives us with the elements that we have in the periodic table. So with the particle, I can independently control size, composition, and shape. And with the bond, I can control sequence, length, and density, the number of, of, of interaction pairs that can take place, for example. OK, so, so how do I think about this? Well, it turns out we began to create models, because we don't, we don't want to just make spectacular structures. We want to create design rules that allow you to build structures on demand. And we came up with what we call the complementary contact model. And the way to think about this is this is a geometric model uh, where the, the governing concept is that uh, enthalpy changes, hybridization is the most important thing in this particular process. It ignores entropy. And it turns out you can do that for greater than 90% of the systems that we're looking at. And what it effectively says is that the most stable structure will maximize the number of duplex DNA connections between particles. And so now you can begin to play games. And you can say, well, if that's true, I can test that. Because if I wanted to form an FCC lattice, right, I'd have to create a structure where every particle could interact with neighboring particles, 12 nearest neighbors. And I can do that by creating a particle that's self-complementary to itself. So if I terminate that with GCGC, GC, if I flip that around, that's CGCG. CG. So all those particles can interact with one another, and in principle, if this is correct, should fall into the FCC structure. If I want a BCC structure, I don't want self-complementary particles. I want two particles that recognize one another and come together. And that's a structure that has eight nearest neighbors. That's the most efficient way of packing these types of architectures. And now if I want more exotic structures, I can change the sizes and shapes of these and how they fit together in a geometric fashion. And I can look at either computationally or on paper which arrangements maximize the contacts that will lead to duplex formation. And so if I make particles smaller, I might, might form an ALB2 lattice, for example, where I have one big and two small particles within a given crystal structure unit cell. Well, we've used this now, and I'm going to bring you up to speed so you can see where we are, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the future as well, to make lots of different types of structures. So here's an FCC lattice, a BCC lattice. Uh, cesium chloride is very similar to BCC, uh, except you might, for example, change the particle size or identity in this case, but the design rules are quite similar in that regard. Here's ALB2, right? That's the one big and two small. You're looking at electron microscopy images on the right. These are small angle scattering patterns on the left taken at the synchrotron. That's how we characterize these structures. On the right, we're always looking at these structures after they've been encased in silica, because when you dry out these structures, the DNA compresses unless you've locked them out in glass. So you're kind of looking at them frozen in silica. Here's chromium silicide. That's three small and one big. Here's cesium 6C60. <laughs> That's one big and six small. So we're just playing with the, the size ratios in this case. And again, geometrically what's favored. And then sodium chloride and simple cubic here. 
Okay, when you start thinking about this, both from a spherical nucleic acid concept and also as what I'd call a programmable atom equivalent, it creates a, a, a blueprint for making a new table of elements, right? As I said, defined by size, shape, and composition. And we've begun to do, do that. And you're going to see examples I've already talked about with respect to gold. Quantum dots, which you heard from Paul, cadmium selenide, palladium, iron oxide, silica type structures. You can even cross-link these oligonucleotides and dissolve the gold core to create a hollow version of a spherical nucleic acid. This is the first true spherical nucleic acid. Things called MOFs, metal organic frameworks, uh, which really give you almost an infinite number of compositions can be turned into spherical nucleic acids or programmable atom equivalents. And you can have organic structures. These are actually important on the, on the drug development side of things. So most of the drugs that are being developed are not gold-based systems. They have a, a, an organic core, a benign core, but that display of oligonucleotides that allows them to be recognized by cells and internalized. Liposomal type of architectures. And this is really neat. Paul made a reference to proteins that Mother Nature's figured out a way of making nanoparticles molecularly pure. Well, we looked at this and said, if that's true, we should be able to take proteins, modify their surfaces, and turn them into programmable atom equivalents, and use the same design rules that we've developed here to program the crystallization of proteins and enzymes. And it turns out you can do that, which is really kind of exciting if you think about it from both a structure control standpoint and an information standpoint and, a, and kind of a man over nature type of standpoint. But this can get really quite sophisticated when you start thinking about how you build and control materials design. We have a technique we call design by deletion, which takes advantage of those hollow structures that I showed you. And so here you can kind of do the thought experiment. You say, what if I made a BCC structure? That's what I showed you how to make two comparably sized particles that are complementary to one another. And what if I took one of those particles in the pair and replaced it with a hollow one? Well, in principle, from an inorganic standpoint, the arrangement of the gold particles, this goes from a, a BCC lattice to a simple cubic lattice. Okay, well, is that true? Well, here we go. You can see here's the BCC, or we could call it cesium chloride, depending on how you want to look at it. The simulation's in black, the data is in red, you can see the lines are all there. We go to simple cubic over here to the right. But now let's think about some of the structures that I showed you. I can begin to convert them into a lot of really exotic structures really rapidly. ALB2, if I get rid of the small guys with a hollow structure, this becomes simple hexagonal. If I get rid of the big guys with a hollow, it becomes graphite-like. If I take cesium-6060 and I get rid of the small guys, it becomes BCC. That's not so interesting. I can make that another way. But this is a really cool one. If I get rid of the big ones, I get what we call lattice X. It has no mineral equivalent. Mother Nature has not figured out a way to make that particular structure. We made six different structures now that don't exist in nature in this regard. So it, it, again, it's, it's a powerful way of thinking about arranging matter in really unique ways. And I think that's going to lead to not only interesting structure control, but as I said, property control. Now it's important if you think about technology development to not just work with polycrystalline structures. And most of the things that I've talked about have been polycrystalline structures. What you'd like are single crystals. That's going to open up the ability to make new devices. Well, we couldn't do that for the longest time. In fact, until about a year and a half ago. Because we were thinking about it the wrong way. We were thinking about the system and this concept of, of defect control from the standpoint of, hey, we know where uh, the, the bond, we know the strength of the bonds because we've programmed them in these particular structures. We know the temperature at which they come apart and at which we can move defects throughout that particular crystal. And that's basically the melting curve associated with the, the material of interest, where the DNA breaks apart. And so we, what we thought was we'd sit here in the melting transition and we could drive defect to the outside of the crystal, kind of the way Paul was talking about it to some extent in the early part of this talk. And what that leads to is greater control. You get higher quality polycrystalline structures, but you don't get single crystals. And then we thought about it. We said the way organic chemists do this is they typically go to higher temperatures, supersaturate the solution, and then they slow cool and allow the system to nucleate. And so we uh, built a, a, a modified PCR machine where we could control the temperature right here, a tenth of a degree for every 10 minutes. And if we take this system, remember all the particles are dispersed because you're above the melting temperature of the DNA, and now you cool through this, and out falls these beautiful rhombic dodecahedron crystals. And it happens every single time. Uh, it's a, an unbelievably reproducible type of, 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 of controlled crystallization because you program the parameters. It, it, it's limited to your understanding of, of, of how you make these structures and, and, and whether you can get to, as I said, the thermodynamic sink. And you can see very clearly here beautiful facets 
This is going to be a fantastic way of studying crystallization. Right? These are atoms on steroids, big structures, easier to uh, uh, visualize. It, it allows us to use a lot of techniques that we can't use with, with atomic-based systems very easily. But it extends to, as I said, anything. The particles go along for the ride. This is that important concept of bond uh, independent control over atom independent control. So here, this is the gold structure I showed you. Here's silver, rhombic dodecahedra. Why? It's a BCC structure. Here's gold in a protein. This is a catalase structure. This is controlling the crystallization of proteins now. Uh, quantum dot type structures. So, so the beauty of this is once you have the design rules and once you know how to make a particular structure, if you can turn them in, turn the particles into, into to a, a, a programmable atom equivalent, where again you have oligonucleotides forced upright in the appropriate density, you will drive the system to this particular structure. But you can begin to do lots of really interesting things here. I've talked about DNA, but we're not limited to DNA. You can go to RNA, LNA, lots of different types of interconnects, modified versions of nucleic acids. Why would you want to do that? Well, RNA is a more functional material from, for example, a catalytic standpoint. I can think about the bond in these types of materials not just as being a directing group, but as being a functional element where I have additional chemical functionality that aligns the struts, and I'll come back to that in a little bit. I can grow crystals off surfaces, layer by layer. This is our version of epitaxy, where I make one perfect layer, a second layer, a third layer, and a fourth layer. I can build structures like the one shown here, where I have hairpins that allow me to have expandable and contractible bonds so I can move the particles apart and bring them back together, controlling the interactions between the particles. And you can do what we call topotactic interconversion, where we can take one set of particles and assemble them into one lattice, let's say a binary structure where we have two different components, and take a third component that can go in and bond to different uh, uh, oligonucleotides within that existing lattice to transform it into a new type of architecture. And so this ability to, again, interconvert matter becomes, I think, really quite interesting and potentially quite important. And that kind of takes me to the next concept. So we kind of straddle in our group chemistry, biology, and medicine, as you can see. And one of the things that really has always, uh, I guess, just inspired and enthralled me is, is, is the concept of, of stem cells. This is an incredible, powerful concept that Mother Nature uses, the idea that you can have a, a, a pluripotent stem cells, uh, and with the right types of chemical cues, you can differentiate those cells into functional cells that can be then used to build different types of tissues. And that is a powerful material synthesis uh, assembly type of, of concept. We don't have that in the nanoparticle area, or we didn't. We do now. Because you can think about creating structures that can be evolved into new functional architectures with appropriate chemical cues if you design them properly. And so, for example, if we take particles, again in cartoon fashion shown here, where we put strands of DNA on the surface, and I've color coded them. These are just different sequences, two hairpins. You can see they, they, they fold over one another. And the recognition element is near the surface, so these particles can't recognize anything. Um, and so in the unbound state, these things just bounce into one another and they don't assemble. But if I supply the appropriate chemical cues, for example, and open up the red and the blue, which have been designed to recognize one another, that should form a BCC structure, right? Because two particles are going to come together, and I've already told you that that favors the formation of a BCC structure. If I add cues that open up the green strands, those are designed to be self-complementary. Go back to the part, original part of the talk. That should be an FCC structure. Well, we can test this. Whoops. In fact, we have. You can take these types of particles and you can use this concept to uh, uh, control the linker type, the stoichiometry, the linker density, and, and even the, 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 the size, the effective size of the particles, which then allows you to drive them down different types of crystallization paths. So that's kind of neat. One set of building blocks with the right chemical cues can be driven down many almost an infinite number of different types of crystallization paths, at least conceptually. Actually, I didn't throw in the data, but that, that, that is in fact the case. Um, so <clears throat> let me go back to this concept of, 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 of the, the atom and the bond. Um, some of you guys may be familiar with this concept of, of, of DNA origami um, and, and uh, what some people refer to as DNA nanotechnology. This is the idea of using oligonucleotides and hybridization to form uh, complex structures. A lot of people ask me, what's the difference between these two types of approaches? Let's start with the similarities. They use oligonucleotides. They have a programmability. They actually stop at that point. Why do they stop? 
Well, if you think about them, they're united by one concept, and that is the idea of controlled valency. The idea that you have to create a rigid structure with bonding elements that lead then to subsequent bonding and directionality is common to both. Here you get, through hybrid, get it through hybridization. Here you don't need that. We don't need hybridization to form valency. The particle core, the particle shape, and the dense packing of the oligonucleotides controls the directionality of the bonding. And of course, then the types of materials you get because these are purely organic structures and of course these are, are primarily inorganic uh, and materials that are defined by the particle composition or the atom in this particular case. Well, if that's true, then that means, as Paul said, controlling particle quality and controlling particle shape is important. So we spend a lot of time doing this, and we developed some of the, the, the best preps for making cubes, octahedra, rhombic dodecahedra, cube octahedra, concave cubes, tetrahexahedra, concave rhombic dodecahedra, uh, truncated ditetragonal prisms. Why? This is our way of controlling the valency of the atoms in these types of structures, the directionality of the bonding. And that allows you then to, to realize some interesting structures. And so just to, to quickly show you uh, some of the capabilities, if I take pr triangular prisms, directionality has a consequence. It forces these structures to stack on top of one another because that's where I get the most duplexes forming between them. If I take rods, these structures will assemble into sheets where all the rods are parallel to one another and hybridize in this direction. And if I have more three-dimensional objects like rhombic dodecahedra or octahedra, these types of structures assemble into three-dimensional materials. And you can see them here. So here are the stacks. Here are the sheets, and then here is the, the three-dimensional type of structure uh, assembled based upon these, these uh, particles recognizing one another. But this leads then to the ability to, to, to control um, crystal habit in kind of a unique way. If you think about this, you know, I showed you one example, a BCC structure forming a rhombic dodecahedra. What happens if you use cubes? Well, you get a cubic-shaped crystal. Right? Because that's the structure that's going to be the Wolf construction there. It's going to maximize uh, hybridization and, and lead to, to, to the thermodynamic, or is the thermodynamic sink. If I take octahedra and functionalize them, what I get are rhombic dodecahedra. I've already shown you how you can get that from spherical particles. But if I take rhombic dodecahedra and functionalize them, you get octahedra. So again, this neat ability to tune across different length scales is, is, is quite important. Let me skip here. I want to get to the last part. You can begin to use this to assemble really quite unique architectures. Here, here are disk type architectures that have been assembled, one dimensional rays. And, and what you say, what does that do for you? Well, this type of structure control now allows you to, to realize new properties and do very fundamental studies. So for example, if I take these types of disk architectures and assemble them into these, these systems, I can begin to ask, what does that do to the, the optical properties of these materials? So well, this is the plasmon resonance that people typically associate with these, these gold disks in, 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 in this particular system uh, in, the, in the free state. And then when they're assembled, you can see this blue shift. You can ask, why is that? Well, we can begin to experimentally study what's been proposed as this, this, this plasmon hybridization model, where you can begin to think again about these as atoms and from a, almost like an MO type of diagram. Uh, you have, when you bring them together, you have a bonding mode and an antibonding mode. But because <coughs> Um, of the dipoles in this case, uh, and the directionality of them, and the way they're assembled, uh, the bonding mode is actually a dark mode, and the antibonding mode is not. And that's why you see a shift to higher energy, whoops, as you go uh, from the, the disassembled state to the assembled state. We can take with this approach and make any sort of stacks we'd like. We can systematically control um, uh, the size of, uh, of the disks, the distances between the disks, all through choice of the different particle building blocks and the oligonucleotides holding these structures together. And that allows us then to tune properties in, 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 in really a, f a phenomenal way. And so here you can see if I take a, 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 an asymmetric system, I can begin to realize a system like this where again the, the dark mode is not completely dark. You can see it's diminished in intensity whereas the, 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 the bright mode is, 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 is of higher intensity and, and is in the antibonding state in this particular configuration. And so I guess my point here is that I can begin to build lots of materials uh, that don't exist in nature, uh, that begin to test some of the ideas and theories of, 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 of the, the folks that, 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 that are uh, in computer or designing systems that can't be made today, uh, and in the process, begin to realize architectures that have new properties that can lead to a lot of applications that I think are going to be enabling, spanning many areas. And you might ask, what are those areas? One is plasmonics. 
One is photonics. Another one is catalysis, being able to systematically control the distances between these. Making uh, uh, energy conversion materials. All this type of systematic control over the atomic, uh, the nano, and then ultimately the, 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 the macroscopic length scale I think is going to be quite important there. I'm getting the nod from the uh, director here, so let me go and, and acknowledge the folks that have done the work. If you're interested in this, Ned Seaman and I wrote a review in science that kind of outlines a lot of the similarities and differences between these areas and kind of maps out a lot of the evolution of this particular field. Um, but more importantly, um, a lot of the, the uh, important contributions have come from, from these folks here, in addition to my own group at Northwestern. I, I've got great collaborators, George Schatz, Monica Verde de la Cruz on the computational side of things. byung Du Lee is really quite important uh, in terms of the small angle scattering work done at Argonne. Um, and this guy, Rob McFarland, who's now a professor at MIT, he was a graduate student in my group. He's just off scale. You're going to see great things from him uh, coming forward. He helped uh, develop a lot of the design roles that I alluded to. And then my group at Northwestern, uh, these are the, the folks that really make it happen. Uh, in the audience, we have a fellowship winner, Jared Mason. Uh, he's, uh, again, somebody you, you should look for. And, and Matt Jones is, I think, a, a, a joint product of Paul and mine who is also coming out. He's done a lot of the, the plasmonic work that I alluded to. And, and, and again, I think you're going to see great things from him as well. I will stop. I like to show this uh, because the good people of, of, of Dubai um, have adopted the spherical nucleic acid <laughs> as their icon in their airport. Thank you very much. Thank you for this uh, magnificent talk. I wanted to keep a few minutes for questions. Uh, please. Bori. I wonder if you or anybody else consider the nonlinear optical properties of circulating flow. It seems very promising, like combining nonlinear properties and all. Well, that's where a lot of that's headed. I mean, um, so so I, you know, I cut out a lot of this right here, but but this ability to 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 control all these parameters, and I, I would say control them uniquely. I, I can't think of a natural system or chemical system, any other chemical system, where you can independently control all of these different parameters, ranging from the particle size and shape, uh, the type of crystal that you get, uh, the, what it's functionalized uh, with in between the, the different particle building blocks gives you a playground to begin to look at optical effects in a very systematic manner. And, and, and we're headed down that path very aggressively. Uh, I can't provide you with a lot of advances there because this ability to make single crystals, so that's the final three-dimensional macroscopic control, just came about literally two years ago, about a year and a half ago. John, please. Um, there is potential. We, we actually have a, a program to try to make quasi-crystals. In fact, if you look at, uh, this was our first attempt. These are, the, these are the most sophisticated structures ever made. We actually thought we had quasi-crystals right here. These are actually clathrates. Uh, this becomes an unbelievable characterization assignment. We actually had to collaborate with uh, Sharon Glotzer and company to computationally look at this and try to figure out what exactly that is. It's an amazing architecture assembled from, from uh, bipyramids. Uh, it takes a lot of additional design consideration to begin to get the type of control that you want. I will not rule it out because I, I got to tell you, even a, a year ago, I would have ruled this out. <laughs> Just maybe one more question.
I can actually uh, not only enumerate them, we've written them down. There, there, there are eight design rules. If you go to that review, eight design rules. And, and they're, they're, they're all dominated. Is that, well, you know, you, you've hit the nail on the head. So, 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 so I believe the beauty of this system is, is that you're decoupling bonding from atom identity. So uh, the rules don't care what the uh, uh, composition of the atom is in this case. It only cares about the size and the shape and the degree of DNA functionalization. And, and so when I got started in this field, one of the things that frustrated me was that there were so many phenomenological types of observations. Isn't this a neat structure? Isn't that a neat structure? And people didn't have design rules and principles that allowed them to systematically make materials architectures. They could make a lot of really neat structures, but they didn't know what they were going to be until they actually made them, and then they characterized them, and, and, and that was it. I wanted the ability to program architecture. And, and this actually allows you to do that. And, and it all, again, distills down to this, and, and it's overly simplified, but it's really an important concept because it works greater than 90% of the time. And that is that this type of, of chemistry is governed by uh, uh, the, the idea that uh, nature will favor the arrangement of particles that maximizes contacts that can lead to hybridization, that can lead to the duplex formation. And that you can uh, do simply by making geometric arguments and looking at all the different possibilities with simple structures which lead to contacts that, that, can, that can engage in, 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 in hybridization. When you get to more sophisticated architectures like the one shown here, you have to begin to use computational tools. But the beauty is you can. So we have the inputs for these folks. So I, I think very shortly, I don't mean 20 years from now, I think four or five years from now, we are going to have computer programs where you're going to be able to say, I want this particular structure, this arrangement of quantum dots, this arrangement of, of metal nanoparticles, whatever I'd like. Um, and the program will spit out the size of the particles you need, the degree of functionalization, and the sequences that are required to get there. And then the conditions will be basically the, 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 the temperature at which, uh, as I said, the, uh, the on-off rates are, are fast. And that is coming very, very shortly. And, and, and I think it's extremely exciting because it's going to really drive then lots of people using this and then taking it much further than we have. Uh, you know, I'm dying for a lot of the, 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 the uh, uh, theoreticians and, and, and physicists to, to begin to uh, uh, get really interested in these types of materials and take them down different types of paths, both for fundamental study purposes, but also for, from an application standpoint. The genes don't learn? Oh, I think uh, they, 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 they kind of do. <laughs> so let's, let's postpone that to uh, the break.